Amen. Beautifully sung, a beautiful song. It's uh, one of my favorites. It's so sweet and uh, just the heart, you know, crying uh, back to the Lord. I'd rather have you and a wonderful truth. Well, turn with me tonight, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. Um, entered kind of a, uh, a unique situation where Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, um, all of them right now are going to be brand new studies. And uh, I don't know if I've ever had that happen before besides when I first came. So uh, each one of them brand new. Uh, so now's a great time to just kind of stick with it. And uh, uh, you'll be from the start all the way through. That would be a blessing. I want to say thanks to all of you who were faithful in the uh, revival meetings. It was a blessing. Um, and uh, thankful. I felt like the attendance was great. Um, and uh, many of you uh, were there every service and uh, very attentive. And that was one thing that uh, Evangelist Miller mentioned was the attentiveness of uh, the crowds each night and how folks were uh, not falling asleep, not wandering about to other things, but attentive to the Lord speaking. And uh, I just uh, I'm thankful for that, I'm thankful for you and for those that come in and, and like I kept saying, who come hungry. And uh, thereby, leave happy. I believe when you want to hear from God, uh, and you come to His Word, His Word is open, uh, then He'll speak to you. And that's certainly a desire here tonight. Well, the book of Hebrews uh, is one I've preached a few messages from, but we've not preached through uh, here since I've been at First Baptist Church. And uh, it's one of the books that probably presents, uh, as far as most Bible students are concerned, some of the most uh, difficult passages in all the Word of God to understand and rightly divide. Uh, what are these passages about? Well, when we get there, uh, hopefully I can give you some uh, reasonable answers. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody, and of course we all understand that, uh, who is uh, going to be able to get to heaven and say, yep, I hit the nail on the head 100% of the time. Uh, in fact, in my life, there have been things that uh, I interpreted a certain way of the Word of God, and, and since then I have I've changed. Uh, on what I believe the interpretation of a passage is to be. Uh, some of those right here in the book of Hebrews. Uh, but we'll get to those. Tonight's is pretty straightforward, and we're just going to look at the introduction. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, is where we're going to begin tonight. And the Word of God tells us this, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and of holding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Boy, what an introduction. The book of Hebrews gets started, it gets started with a, with a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Doesn't waste any time with formalities, but right into some deep doctrinal truths. And I just want to look at this introduction here tonight and glean some things from it. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to be in your house again tonight. Lord, to wrap up this Lord's Day by asking you once again to feed us, to feed us from your word to feed us by your truth. Lord, we need you. We pray that you would take your divine, divinely inspired word and apply it to our hearts. Uh, Lord, may we truly be hungry to hear from you, to learn of you, uh, to be able to discern the word of God. Help us tonight in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the book of Hebrews, before we even get into this particular passage, I'd like to just give you a little background to the book. Uh, because a lot of the misunderstandings that come regarding the book of Hebrews are because people ignore the context in which the book was given. It's one of the most debated questions in all of uh, Bible study is who wrote the book of Hebrews? What human was the human writer? And uh, there's a lot of different answers out there. Uh, the book itself does not reveal its human author, and perhaps that in and of itself is a revelation as to who wrote it. I believe that the writer was the Apostle Paul. The writer had obvious, substantial knowledge of both Jewish religion 
as well as the Old Testament. All the way through, there's going to be references to the sacrificial system. There's references to the, to the, uh, to the tabernacle and the high priest and all the different work. And there's Old Testament quote after Old Testament quote. So as someone who was very knowledgeable of the Old Testament, certainly the Apostle Paul fits the bill. He was not only a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but he was a Pharisee and a zealous Pharisee. He was one who knew the Old Testament better than any other human being. Furthermore, not only that they have uh, the writer have obvious substantial knowledge of both the Jewish religion and Old Testament, but also in this book, you meet several of Paul's familiar companions. In fact, Hebrews wraps up. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, and you notice who the writer tells us about. Verse 23, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. And so we find Timothy reference. Now, Timothy, obviously a close associate of the Apostle Paul, and we notice here the hope at the conclusion of the book that Timothy would be accompanying the writer. So again, I think that points to the Apostle Paul. We can't be definitive about it. But I believe the fact that the writer is not identified also points to the Apostle Paul. Why? Well, because Paul, though he knew the, the Hebrew religion, and, and though he knew Judaism inside and out, and though he knew the Old Testament, and, and though he himself was a Jew, yet he was hated by the Jews. I mean, the Jews hunted him down. Wherever he went, they would follow him into the different communities and, and have him uh, on one occasion stoned and obviously imprisoned. They hated him. Remember what happened when Paul just went back into Jerusalem? How that the whole city became an uproar? And so if he's going to write a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to try to touch the heart of the Jewish people, one thing that can be deleted so that it's not an obstacle is his name. You start out the letter, the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews, but probably right away, close the book. Say, I don't want any of it. Because they did not like Paul. Furthermore, we recognize Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles, and not to the Jews. Though he had a heart for the Jewish people, and though everywhere he went, he started with the Jewish people, and then would go to the Gentiles when the Jews rejected the message, Yet, we find that he was the apostle of the Gentiles. And so, as you put all those things together, I believe that Paul was the human writer of the book of Hebrews. Now, you can disagree, and you can be wrong. That's fine. Uh, but uh, it really doesn't matter about interpreting the book, but I just find that a fascinating and interesting study. Furthermore, I think this is important in the book, and that is the context of Hebrews. There's a number of factors that were in play in the world at the time, when the book of Hebrews that was written, that are not in play today. Namely this, Hebrews was written prior to the destruction of the temple. It was written prior to the destruction of the temple. That means that all of the temple rituals were still being carried out at the time the book was written. On these, every single day, the nation was offering sacrifice. Every day, I'm sorry, not every day, but only once a year would the nation send the high priest into the holiest place and, all, and sprinkle blood there at the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. The nation was still offering lambs and bulls and turtle doves. All this was still going on. The sacrifice was still being carried out. But you know what? It's a sad reality. Why? Because all of those things, from the Day of Atonement to the feast days, to the, uh, to the tabernacle itself, to the sacrifice, all of it pointed to Jesus Christ. All of it was a shadow of things to come. All of it was just a picture teaching a lesson, and the lesson came. The fulfillment came. Jesus had been here, and he went to the cross, and he shed his blood so that that sacrifice and that picture was complete. It wasn't needed anymore. The fulfillment was here. It all prophesied of what was going to take place with Jesus. And then Jesus came, and still the Jews carried out the sacrifice. They missed the reality and settled instead for the shadow. The Bible tells us when Jesus Christ died on the cross, 
This is an interesting study in and of itself. But as Jesus died, there were a number of miracles that took place as he gave his life. We remember the earthquake. We remember the, the graves being opened, it says in Matthew, and some folks arose. I'm not sure what, what exactly transpired and what exactly that means, but that's a fascinating thing. But one of the things that took place when Jesus gave up his spirit, the Bible tells us that the veil of the temple was torn in half from the top to the bottom. That's a picture, right? The moment Jesus said, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, that veil was torn, and it's from the top to the bottom. God tearing it down to man, and the veil being removed, now everybody sees right into the holiest place. The holy of holies. And now there's access. In the book of Hebrews, the writer is going to detail what that was all about, and that is that by Jesus' blood, we now have access into the holiest. And so there, can you imagine being in the temple that day, the priests carrying out their work, and they hear this huge, huge tearing sound. Again, this veil, it wasn't just simply something thin, but it was a very thick curtain, more like a wall. I mean, for that thing to be torn in half, boy, what a sound that must have been. And they go in, and they look, and they say, I don't know if they cover their eyes or what, but they can look right into the holy place, right into the place that pictured the very presence of God. But what happened? Think about it. They're still carrying out the sacrifice. What'd they do? They built another veil. They built another veil. Now, isn't that sad? Jesus tore it down. You know what that veil represents? That veil represents our sin. That veil is what was keeping man from entering into the presence of God. It was the wall. It was the hindrance. It was the obstacle. But Jesus came, and by his blood, it was torn down so that man could come to God. And yet, here's the Jews, and they miss it all. And not only do they, uh, do they not uh, worship Jesus Christ, but they rebuild the wall. They put it back up. And boy, what a picture that is of false religion. You know that's what false religion does? Jesus tears the wall down, but false religion builds another wall between man and God. And that's what happened with the Jews. They built another wall. They made it now impossible again for man to come to God because they would not trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We look at the book of Hebrews. These are some of the backdrops. Also, as you study the letter, you'll discover that the recipients of this letter were in a very sad state. When you read the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you'll come across a group that traveled with Israel, and they were called the mixed multitude. Well, this book of Hebrews was really written to a mixed multitude. There were a number in this group that received the letter that weren't saved yet. They had come to the precipice. They had seen everything and understood what Christ had done. But at the same time, they're holding back. They're holding back. They don't want to commit themselves to Jesus. We'll talk about why in just a moment. Others in this same group were carnal Christians. They were more interested in their physical life and the temporal things than they were in the spiritual things. Others are referred to in this, word of, in this book as babes and unskillful in the word. And some of them were thinking of going back to the Judaistic ways and the Old Testament sacrifice. Now, why? Why is it the people that would hear of Jesus Christ, having seen all the pictures, and I believe, even the book of Hebrews tells us, comes to perfect knowledge so that they're convinced Jesus was the fulfillment, Jesus was the Messiah, and yet they will not put their faith in him. Why? Why would some who have put their faith in him be tempted to go back? Well, I think that there's a couple of reasons. I think, number one, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the first century Jewish Christian. Number one, how hard was it for the disciples to grasp the idea of a church? They struggled with it, especially initially. Remember what they thought was going to happen when Jesus Christ arose? They thought that then he was going to establish his earthly kingdom. That's what they were all looking for. And in the Old Testament, that's what everyone was looking for as well. They were looking for that kingdom on earth. Even at the ascension, they asked Jesus, hey, is it now that you're going to restore and refresh the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said, no. He said, I'm going away and you're going to be my witnesses. 
it's not right now. I believe that these same Jewish ones, you know, they've all grown up. They heard about the kingdom that that was coming to earth and one who would reign on the throne of David. And and so now they see Jesus and they're hopeful for that. But here in their lives, they're not seeing it. And they didn't know, like you and I, we can look back and it seems kind of, you know, boggles our mind because we're 2,000 years down the road, right? We knew it wasn't coming right away. We know that. We can see that. By the way, I think it's coming very soon. But we look back and we can say, oh, it wasn't going to be right away. Well, they didn't know that. I think some of them felt like it was going to be maybe within their own generation that Jesus would come back. I believe he could have, but that wasn't the plan of God. He didn't come back. And so I believe because they hadn't seen the return and they're still hopeful for that kingdom, that they're starting to slide back. Furthermore, that early church suffered greatly. Think about the church in Jerusalem. It was the first church to go under intense persecution and just continued, continued for decades. We see what happened to Stephen. We see what happened to the disciples. Again and again, the persecution would come. And when you're again looking at people who are babes in Christ, some of them, a lot of times that's a struggle for a babe in Christ, to suffer for Christ. And really to look at the Jewish people and they're carrying out their systematic religion and going through their motions and and everything seems to be just fine with them and they're suffering, hey, that's hard. Look at what happened with Asaph. He said he was almost gone. Why? Because he saw the prosperity of the wicked and here these Jewish, these, these Jewish believers could look at the regular Jewish folks and say, they're prospering, and here we are suffering. Maybe that's the way to go. Hey, do we not sometimes ourselves operate based off a of circumstance? Do we not sometimes think, well, maybe I wasn't in the will of God because now all these hard things are coming on me. Hey, don't judge whether or not you're in the will of God by whether things are hard or easy. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. Look, a lot of times when we're on the right path, God allows those things to come to our lives. Why? That we might grow. Because the trying of our faith worketh patience. Let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, the Bible says. Those hard times are purifying times. And they're good for us. I hear these people, I believe, could be looking at their circumstances and thinking, well, maybe, maybe this isn't right after all. Maybe going back is the best thing. Not to mention a third reason that I think that they may be tempted to go back. How hard is it to turn your back on your heritage? Oh, I see it today. The people were raised in a certain religion. And they'll be told, you know, to be a Jones is to be a Catholic or To be uh, whatever is to be this. And then when they come to Christ, you know, all the family begins to turn against them. In fact, just this week, I heard of a family that said to somebody, I'm not talking to you anymore. He had said to them, he said, I'm no longer a Catholic, I'm a Christian. And they said, well then, we're disowning you. You know, pray for them. But you know, that's what happened. And I believe many of these Jewish believers probably face the same thing. So here they are struggling. Here they are under persecution. Here they are with that that, uh, hope deferred, as it says in the book of Proverbs. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. They're hoping for the kingdom. It's not coming to them. And it's a struggle. and, And there's persecution. And everything seems so challenging. And so I believe that many of them begin to slide back and go back and start offering their sacrifices again. And it's under this backdrop that the epistle to the Hebrews is written. And the theme of the book is this. From the very beginning all the way through, what you're going to see, the declaration of the writer of Hebrews is this. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. The whole book is about the superiority of Jesus Christ. And he's going to bring them before all that the Old Testament offered, all that you had under Moses, all that you had under the law, the tabernacle, the sacrifice. And what you're going to find is Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better high priest. Jesus is a greater leader than Moses. Jesus is better. By the way, we see it right away. Notice in Hebrews chapter 1 now, 
It tells us in verse number one, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past on the fathers by the prophets. That's a wonderful truth. But now, something even better has happened. Now, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Isn't that better? <laughs> it's one thing for the prophets to come. It's another thing that the son has come. But you know, catch that word there in that phrase we read in, in verse number one. God spake. The subject and the verb. The verb. God spake. Boy, what a wonderful truth. I've got a great book on the book of Hebrews in my office, and it was written by a, uh, a Bible uh, teacher of the past and preacher. His name's Andrew Murray. And just on this one phrase, oh, he had a wonderful chapter. I loved reading it. I want to share some of those things with you tonight. First of all, God has spoken. Andrew Murray points out, this is the magnificent portal by which we enter the temple where God is to reveal his glory to us. You and I get to see God's glory. Why? Because he spoke. He spake to us. Think about, think about it. Speaking is the vehicle of fellowship. Speaking is the vehicle of fellowship. Hey, when a, a young man and a young woman come together, you know, what is it that they're going to do? They're going to try to get to know each other. Well, let me ask you, how are they going to try to get to know each other? What are they going to do? They're going to talk, right? They're going to talk. They don't just come together and just look at each other and, you know, just observe each other. At least I hope not, right? That's not a real deep relationship. The deep relationships are those where there is speaking. My wife and I, we enjoy dates together. Oh, that's a wonderful thing, dating your wife. And uh, I love dates with my wife. Do you know what? When we go somewhere, by the way, we don't just sit there and look at our phones. The phones are put away, and we talk. We enjoy just the ride together. We can hold hands. We can talk. There's no distractions. I love my distractions, but there's no distractions on those dates, and we can just talk and communicate and have relationship and fellowship, just the two of us. But, you know, fellowship requires the speaking, right? That's what speaking entails. When we look at God speaking to us, it is opening that door for fellowship. What a wonderful truth. I like this as well. God has spoken. When man speaks, it's the revelation of himself to make known the otherwise hidden thoughts and dispositions of his heart. When God, who dwells in light that's inaccessible, speaks out of the heights of his glory, it's so that he may reveal himself. Hey, God speaks in numerous ways, doesn't he? God speaks in numerous ways, but the greatest way that he speaks is by his word and all that he reveals to us of himself. What a wonderful truth. This truth ought to excite us, and this truth ought to inspire us to get into his word. Boy, how sad, how sad is the Christian that doesn't open up God's word. When God speaks so that we can know the heart and the mind of God, what a wonderful reality that is. I can know God. He's revealing himself to me. One of the, uh, the, the greatest uh, just little bit, tidbits that was shared with me on our time is, is when you read the Bible, no matter where you're reading, you can ask, what is God trying to reveal to me about himself in this passage? What is God showing me about himself in this passage? No matter what chapter, no matter what verse, you can look at it and say, God is sharing something with me about himself. Because this is God speaking to you and me. God spake. What a wonderful truth. We notice also in verse number one, spoke by the prophets. That speaks in Old Testament times. He tells us in verse number one, he spoke at sundry times and in divers manners. That means varied times. The Old Testament was given over the course of at least a thousand years. You know, it took over a thousand years to write the Old Testament. The Bible is the most remarkable book because it's not man's book, it's God's book. And we got all these different authors over all these different years, and yet the message is unified. It's one. We look in the Old Testament, the first five books, and of course, Job, possibly all written by Moses, but about 1500 B.C., Meanwhile, Malachi wraps it all up 
at 400 B.C. So there you have about 1,100 years that the Old Testament was being written. Furthermore, not only in the duration of the time which it was given, but also there are varied times, varied occasions in which the Bible was given. In the Old Testament, we've got some occasions like the Psalms, where there's occasions of rejoicing. Isn't it exciting to read those Psalms and just hear that exultant praise for God? Other occasions of devotion, such as Deuteronomy. Then there were some occasions of trial. You read the book of Daniel. It was a book written in the midst of trial, and, and even some books written out of despair, like the book of Lamentations. So it's sundry times, various occasions. It also tells us in divers' manners. That's interesting. We see the varied manners. God gave the Ten Commandments in a very unique way, didn't he? He just wrote them out on a table of stone himself. He didn't use a man to write them. He did it himself. Furthermore, we also read about in the Old Testament that some of it came by vision. Amos described the revelation he received as a burden. Very interesting. God spoke in diverse ways at diverse times. And he also used diverse people. Moses, a man educated in the courts of Egypt. David, a shepherd boy. Ezra, a scribe. Daniel, a Babylonian wise man. Amos, one of the herdsmen of Tekoa. God spoke through people, different times, in different ways. But the great truth is, God spoke. And again, he tells the verse number two, He hath in these last days spoken unto, unto us by his Son. When you think about all the ways that God speaks, and I referenced this a moment ago, the Lord speaks to us, number one, through creation. Does creation speak? Yes, it does. What, is it, what are we told by creation? Well, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. You know, in the days in which we live where we can get an even a deeper glimpse into the way that we are made and the way that our world operates, we're astounded at the omniscience of God. And not only the omniscience of God, but the omnipotence of God, that he could create it all. That's what we're told in Romans chapter 1, that the things of God are clearly seen. What things? His eternal power and Godhead. Just look at creation. Look at the storm. Look at the majestic mountain. Look at life. Consider birth and all the miracles and the wonderful things that we can see. So that with the psalmist we say, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works among the children of men. That's what creation tells us. Furthermore, the Lord speaks to us through history. It's tragic that people today in the United States don't know history. It's a tragedy that many are rewriting history. And there's people that were good guys in the past that have become the bad guys today. It's a distortion. But you know what? God speaks through history. One of the great historical lessons that we can learn is the nation of Israel and the Jews. And we can see God's faithfulness and God's power and God's provision again and again in their lives. There's many history lessons that speak of God. Another powerful revelation of God is our conscience. You and me all have it. We didn't decide whether we want it or not. Nope, I don't want a conscience. Goodbye. You know, we can't go to the doctor and ask him to surgically remove it, right? We can try to deny it. We can sear it, but we all have a conscience. Where did it come from? I love to ask the atheist that question. Why do you have a conscience? Why do you have a conscience? Why is it your conscience only tells you about right and wrong? Don't you wish the conscience would tell you when you're, you got your vehicle to the mechanic, whether the mechanic is honest or not? I wish the conscience would do that. I wish the conscience would have helped me when I was in math class, you know, and doing my arithmetic. I wish the conscience would help with that. But it doesn't do anything except for what? It deals with right and wrong. It deals with God's law. It says in the word, the law being written on our hearts. So everybody knows it's wrong for me to walk up and punch Brother Joe in the face. It's wrong. Yeah. It's very wrong. We know that. It's the conscience. It testifies to us and speaks of God. Furthermore, above all these things and superseding any combination of these is the revelation of his word. You know, all that we can learn from creation and all that we can learn from history and all that we can learn through our conscience and God speaking, we still could never know of the wonderful plan of salvation 
were God not to have spoken it in his word. Hey, we could look at the world and we can understand by our conscience there is a holy, powerful God and I'm a sinner because I've broken the law. We can understand that. But where do I go for the answer? It's right here. People tell you all the time, well, God loves you. Well, how do you know God loves you? How do you know? Because God told you. The greatest revelation of all. It's in his word. The simple song the kids sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I'm so tired of these progressive Christians today who talk about, you know, don't just make it for the Bible tells me so. We need something better. I'm sorry, but there is nothing better. It's what God gave, and it's how God speaks, and it's God's revealed truth. But you know the greatest way that God ever spoke to man? Even greater than the Bible. That was Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh, who came to earth. The greatest revelation of God himself in the person of Jesus. Tells us in verse 2, he has spoken by his son. Certainly that includes the red letters that we read in our Bible. By the way, that's an interpretation. Those aren't necessarily right. There could be parts of those red letters that Jesus didn't speak, parts that are in black that he did speak. That's just different ones who understand that's what Jesus spoke. Now, when it says Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we can take that, that Jesus said it. But you know what? Jesus spoke by more than that, didn't he? He spoke by his life. He spoke by his sacrifice. In fact, Jesus Christ, what's the name that he was given in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word. God speaking to man through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth. We look in this passage. We understand the life of Jesus is God communicating himself to us. People want to try to know God apart from knowing Jesus. You'll never know God unless you know Jesus. And that's the reality. Third thing that we see in Hebrews in this passage is the Son. We see the Son. We see, first of all, Jesus in creation. We notice in verse number two that he hath appointed, he hath been appointed heir of all things. And what do you get an inheritance? You get the inheritance at the end. So note this also. By whom also he made the world. When did that happen? That happened at the beginning. Notice in verse number 3. When he, um, when he upholds all things by the word of his power. Look at Jesus involved in creation. He was there at the beginning because he made it all. Now in the middle he's upholding it all. And at the end he's the heir of it all. That's Jesus Christ. That's who he is. These verses are some of the greatest testaments to the deity of Jesus Christ. The next time we're in Hebrews, I hope to show you some passages, some verses from the Old Testament which declare, and this is a wonderful truth, and I love to share it with the folks that come knocking at my door, Jesus is Jehovah. And use that name because it's true. And that's what here in this, in this passage the writer is going to show us. But notice in this in this, in this place, all of creation's history is about the Son. Again, He is the creator of all things. He made the world. Jesus did. The maker of the worlds, as it says in Colossians chapter 1, by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Jesus Christ, the creator. John chapter 1 as well. And he was in the beginning with God, the Bible says, and He was God. And it says all things were made by Him. All things by Jesus Christ. Consider his power. What power is this? The creator. What power? To just speak the worlds into being. Isn't it interesting, at the very beginning of the book, you find he said, let there be light, and there was light. His words that bring life. What power in Jesus. At the conclusion of the book in Revelation, there is something proceeding out of his mouth. When all the world's armies come to oppose Jesus Christ, he just simply speaks the word and they're destroyed. The power of Jesus Christ, all power, no limit, infinite power. What a privilege then to serve Jesus, to be a servant, the all-powerful God, to bear his name. We sing the We sing the words, all hail the power of Jesus' name. We're invited to go in the name of Jesus. You know what? There's power. 
creator. Notice what else we see about Jesus. Notice his person. We're told in verse number 3 of Jesus Christ that he is the brightness of the glory of God. Like the light that beams from the sun bursting forth on us. And all that we know about the sun is the light emanating from it. So is Jesus. All that we know of God and his character, it's beamed out through the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus being God in the flesh. You notice the words in verse number three. He being the express image of his person. Person speaks of one's essence or substance. You know what Jesus said? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because their essence was the same. He was the image of the invisible God, is what it says elsewhere in the Word of God. The only time that God has ever taken on a form was Jesus Christ coming to earth. For God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. You notice in all this passage the person of Jesus Christ and his power, but also he references his pardon. Look at what we're told in verse 3. When he had by himself purged our sins. He's talking about Jesus being better. He's better than the prophets. God spoke unto us by his Son, the creator of all things, the all-powerful one, God in the flesh, and the one who takes away our sins. These ones who are going back to that Old Testament worship. They're going back to the prophets. And here the writer says, you're leaving behind the greatest, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, because he takes away our sins. What a wonderful truth. But then we also notice this in verse number three. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high commentator made this statement the sitting of the son at god's right hand was by the act of the father it's never used of jesus's pre-existing state co-equal with the father but always of his exalted state as the son of man after his suffering it was after his sufferings he went to the right hand where he acts as mediator between god and man our intercessor and obviously the place of preeminence And that's what he's pointing out at the very beginning. Jesus is preeminent. We read in the book of Philippians, turn with me there if you would in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, it tells us after Jesus Christ had died, after he had purged our sin, as it says in Hebrews 1, and we see in verse number 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you read those words in Hebrews chapter 1, that ought to be the heart's profession. Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just a Lord, but the Lord. And not just the Lord, But my Lord, there is coming a time at the end of time when every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. We live in a world where people are trying to reject God and his created order. I was sharing with some this morning. There's now 40-some schools in England that have banned the young ladies in the school from wearing skirts. Everybody now has to wear slacks. Why? Well, because they don't want to offend the transgender. And so in order to be diverse, everybody has to do the same thing. It doesn't make sense, does it? But you know what the world is gearing up for? Is the embrace of one thought, of one speech, of one religion, of one ruler, and his name's the Antichrist. And you know what? The world's going to eagerly embrace him causes our skin to crawl, and and yet at the same time, our world's gearing up for it. But you know why? It's because people are rebelling against this truth. They don't want Jesus as Lord. The statement that has been made to me throughout my life, (laughs) my dad used to make it, Brother Lawrence used to make it, 
People are going to do what people want to do. You know why? Because they're their own Lord. They're their own Lord. You know, for you and I, I hope that first of all, we've come to that place where we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because if we don't do it in this life, when we bow before him in the future, it'll be too late. You see what it says, things that are under the earth. I believe that could be a reference to people who've been in hell. They're going to be resurrected. Did you know that the people in hell are going to be brought out of hell and stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment? And you know what they're going to do there? They're going to fall on their face before Jesus Christ, and they're going to declare, Lord. And Jesus is going to say to them, depart. I never knew you. That's why it's so important today that you know Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He'll purge all your sins, just as he promised. But you reject him. And the word of God is very clear. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it will go on to ask the question, how shall we escape? In fact, even more, it says, how much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy who has counted the blood of Christ of nothing? You know those who will face the sorest punishment in the lake of fire? It's those who had the clear understanding that Jesus is Lord, who heard the gospel message and rejected it. Their sufferings will be the worst. As Jesus Christ said, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will for those cities who saw Jesus and understood who he was and rejected him. The greatest sin in all the earth is to reject Jesus Christ. Have you bowed the knee to Jesus? And like Thomas, when he saw the resurrected Savior, my Lord and my God, have you embraced Jesus Christ? He that hath a son hath life. But you know what? Even once we have been saved, there's a struggle every day. Struggle going on in your life even right now. A struggle between the flesh and the flesh and the Spirit. And you know what it comes down to? It's who's going to be Lord. Who's going to be Lord? In the choices and the decisions that we make on a daily basis, who is going to be Lord of you? We see in the book of Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel, it said. I'm telling you today, there is a king, and his name is Jesus. And we should fall on our face before him. My Lord, my God, what wilt thou have me to do? If you're here today and you need to get saved, better make it today. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Boast not thyself tomorrow, though knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now's the accepted time, and now's the day of salvation. Fall before Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Cry out to him. Trust you as my Lord, as my Savior. You've been saved, and tonight, your response ought to be, Lord, I want it to be more than just words. You're my Lord. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say, is what Jesus said. He's Lord of all, and we belong at his feet. Here am I, send me. That's the place of fulfillment. That's the place of blessing. That's the place where life just makes sense. Don't do your own thing. Don't follow your own will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be health, the navel marrow to thy bone. Strength, blessing, just as we saw this morning. God longs to bless. Will you follow him as Lord? Do you know him as Savior? Will you follow him as Lord? Let's close. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word tonight. Thank you for this book to the Hebrews. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Lord, for revealing yourself to us through him. Lord, I thank you tonight for the wonderful truths that are contained in these preliminary verses. And Lord, I ask that you would help them not to just fill our minds, but Lord, to fill our lives. May we humbly bow for you as King, as Lord of us, as Lord of me. And I pray that tonight you would help us to live out that truth, day by day, asking, seeking for thy will, not ours. Help us to bow before you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.